welcome all and good morning after the yesterday's session. Uh, first, thank you so much for being here. Like, thank you for our audience as well. Um, it wouldn't be the same if you weren't just there, for sure. Please, uh, can you quickly introduce yourself um, and tell us in what sentence your vision for the future, and maybe it changed uh, since yesterday, so if it did, let us know. I'm a researcher at the Future Humanity Institute, a lapsed computational neuroscientist interested in human enhancement. My vision for using neurotechnology is to make us a happier, smarter, wiser, and more distributed uh, species. Uh, my name is Zarina Agnew. Uh, I'm a neuroscientist. Uh, I think my vision for the future of neurotech is uh, enhancing our individual uh, abilities to do things, uh, but not in a homogenous way, really looking to see uh, how, we, how we can uh, individually uh, find different niches. Uh, but actually uh, increasing uh, sociality, so uh, being able to share information so that we can get to sort of hyper consensus uh, uh, and a much more sort of representative kind of democracy. I'm Mary Lou Jepson. I'm founder and CEO of Open Water and working on uh, brain-computer interfaces that are non-invasive uh, as well as medical imaging systems that are dramatically lowering cost, and so I believe this is going to happen a lot faster than probably anybody else in the room because two-thirds of humanity lacks access to medical imaging. So we can see inside of our bodies for inexpensive um, cost structure using consumer electronics. That also means we can see inside of our brains in very high resolution and has been known for um, about a decade now, if I throw you in an MRI scanner for an hour, I can tell you if you've got a tumor. If I do it for 100 hours, I can tell you what words you're about to say, what images are in your head, what music you're thinking of, whether you're in love or not, and so forth. And so I believe, um, as I saw here, the blood-brain barrier, that's already done. Um, and we can neuromodulate with the same system. And so what I think is happening a lot faster is that we're going to be able to transcend language and share our thoughts directly with each other. And there are some profound um, utopian and dystopian uh, parts of that. Yeah. My name is Daniel Barquet. Um, I am a computer scientist, uh, a dilettante sort of neuroscience reader. And I think I'm put on stage because I'm good at poking holes at things and nuancing things. But I think that... Um, thing that I'm really committed to is nuancing our different models of human behavior and human cognition and how that relates to technology. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. So yesterday we um, went through some pretty dire uh, dystopian scenarios and um, brighter utopias. And so actually I'd like to start with um, Zarina's scenario just quickly because I am going to show you how it went. Um, this is uh, Zarina's dystopia. So it goes, it goes again like two, two paragraphs under the slide. And this is Zarina's utopia, which is full. Can you tell if she's a pessimist or an optimist? <laughs> okay, so Zarina, could you just really briefly, in like one minute, explain the dystopia and then explain the utopia and you know, explain this, um, the fact that it's the same technology, actually, you were talking about in both scenarios. Okay, one minute. Okay. Uh, so we started from a place where um, uh, access to the kinds of technology that allow us to uh, sort of interpret neural activity is widespread. So we have optical imaging, we have uh, ultrasound imaging, we have mobile EEG, uh, and we also have access to like implants in the brain, which not only allow us to read um, read what's going on in the brain, but also to interfere, uh, so to control your, your behavior. And that this technology will be welcomed into our bodies, just as uh, mobile phones have, and uh, Google Homes into our homes, and all these kinds of technologies. And that uh, around the age of 17 to 21, most humans will welcome these sort of implants and wearable technology into their lives. So that's the sort of place where we started with technology. So the dystopia is that all of the information with which um, uh, all of the information coming from these uh, uh, thought reading mechanisms are owned by private corporations uh, and the government has access to this information also. And so, um, whereas in today's world we're really struggling for freedom of speech, 
in this dystopian future 30 years from now, we're really struggling to defend our freedom for thought and that cognitive liberty has become a thing of the past. And that those with means get to use this technology to enhance their abilities and live a wonderful, neurally enhanced world, but those without means uh, suffer from a real loss of their cognitive freedom. That those with means uh, can find technology and resources to protect themselves against this kind of uh, invasion. Um, and, and so we discussed the idea that there are neurofeedback mechanisms, shielded spaces, places in the world that are shielded from these kinds of technology where those with means can go uh, to um, sort of live out their lives with cognitive freedom, and those without means would have no way to protect themselves. So we would end up with a sort of class system uh, segregated around the cognitively free and the cognitively incarcerated. That's the dystopia. <laughs> Uh, so the utopia starts from the same technology, uh, but rather than having uh, a, a select few people in the world having uh, access to this information, we, r we rather had individual uh, ability to decide what to do with that information. Uh, and so uh, we all in this room, for example, could decide to share with each other for the purposes of this weekend uh, some of our neural information. Uh, so we could say, you know, as we're like trying to decide what we do for the afternoon, we could uh, switch on to the same sort of network and share some of our information and actually reach a sort of hyper-social um, space where we, we can understand why people are voting the way they're voting because you can see some of their backstory. So if we're all voting on what to have for lunch this afternoon, uh, if I just get the result, I don't necessarily w feel represented by that vote. But if I understand why everyone in this room has decided to choose gluten-free or vegan or whatever it is, um, it's, you can end up with a much more representative sort of collective outcome. So in the utopian world, actually what we get to is the people own their um, sort of cognitive information, and actually we end up in this hyper-democratic place uh, where we can actually start to solve some of the world's problems. Yay! <laughs> Great. Thank you. <laughs> so, does someone want to expose the, uh, or ex explain, sorry, explain uh, the, the, the existential hope scenario um, that um, you came up with, perhaps like Enders, um, on how to steer away from uh, this dystopia toward this utopia. Uh, if you could switch to that slide, yes. that might be helpful. Actually, uh, as a first thing, which actually isn't there, but it was in my group, was a discussion about the ability to opt out of technologies, yes. which is an interesting challenge because it's not just that you're legally allowed to opt out, it must also be socially and practically be possible. Um, <clears throat> so the interesting thing here about the... the uh, issue is, it's not enough to have the right kind of laws, but they can certainly help. Uh, you want to establish a bit of bedrock uh, about cognitive liberty, uh, but you need other factors too. You need to foster tolerance, and this is where this scenario links up with other uh, abundant scenarios, because a society that is material abundant has a much easier time developing tolerance. Uh, if everybody feels that they're trapped in a zero-sum game, tolerance of diversity is going to be low. So we need to work on that social aspect to actually make cognitive liberty a real liberty. And that is not dissimilar, of course, from the struggle for fixing other liberties. Then we have this issue of actually getting the knowledge we need to actually figure out whether the implants work, whether they're safe, whether they're representative, etc. So we need to have people that are representative population. We need probably to have an open data for neural data too. Just like in genetics, it's actually very useful to have open databases. Again, you need to safeguard them in the right way so you can have your right to neural privacy. In and another important thing is, of course, neural defense. So I actually have been working with some colleagues at the neuroscience department in Oxford about the problem that bra deep brain stimulator implants today, they have wireless, but they lack firewall, they don't have encryption, they don't have logging, they're totally hackable, and you can do some mildly scary things with that. That's not good. And with, as the neural implant systems and the various ways of manipulating brains are getting more developed, we need to actually make sure that we have proper firewalls, proper security, etc. So we might want to develop good forms of neural defense. Some of that might be mental techniques. 
There might be ways of thinking so nobody can read your mind or don't want to read your mind. So uh, that was the kind of top uh, action plan. Do you want me to be getting on the goals too? Uh, what? Sorry? Uh, do you want me to deal with the five-year, 10-year, and 50-year goals? Or? Um, well, if you want to give a goal, yes. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, so one of the most obvious early things is finding a way of dealing with the blood-brain barrier. It's an amazingly solid barrier uh, on one level, and it's terribly annoying. It's also quite essential because keeping the brain separated from the rest of the stuff going on in the body is generally a good thing, except that for many medications, it would be very useful to get through it. We want to you know, control it in the right way to get neural interfaces working. So figuring out ways around this might be a good uh, moonshot over the next five years. Similarly, we also need to figure out ways of lowering the threshold of entry. There are some forms of neural technology that are probably going to require brain surgery for the next five years. They are not going to be ho anything for hobbyists. But other forms of uh, non-invasive brain stimulation and brain reading are advancing much faster, as we heard, and we might want to develop that. They also need the right kind of legal protective frameworks. You need to make them cheap enough but also possible to experiment with. There have been some interesting results there in the European Union, thanks actually to a colleague of mine, Hannah Maislin, who wrote a white paper about how trying to balance safety with exploration in uh, brain stimulation, which later was adopted actually by the uh, European Council and actually put into legislation. Whether that matters, whether it fixes things is another matter, but it shows that it's actually possible to surprisingly quickly affect policy here. Over the 10 years, we better cybersecurity for neural data, which is going to be trickier. But um, again, uh, it's pretty clear that we might want to develop cognitive liberty technology just like we want to protect our privacy and protect our uh, transparency. And in the real long run, of course, we need to have much better read and write op opportunities for our brains. Uh, otherwise, we can't achieve very much. And that there should be minimal risk. because. As soon as the risk goes down, then the price goes down, more people can play around with the technology and actually find actual applications. It's the same thing that happened to computers. Once we got the home computers, an entire generation started programming and finding out what we could actually be used for, rather than leaving it to a priesthood in a suit and tie. There's a, there's a particular point that I want to zoom in on at some point in this panel, and it probably makes sense to do it here in, in the cognitive defense regime, which is, I want to point out some of these things can be a little weirder than I think we're currently stating, which is <clears throat> even today, uh, we, we, it's easy to say one should be more open. You should be more open with your thoughts. I should be able to read your face more openly. But it, the, the, some of the weirder cognitive defenses are when you end up not knowing what's true, right? So the, someone who has a, a, a terrible poker face and can't hide what they think might develop weirder mechanisms by actually forgetting what they think or about not being able to think correct thoughts in order to avoid the bad social outcomes. So one of the dystopian things in here is that good cognitive defenses, as you point out, might end up being really truth-ripping things if, if we're all able to read each other's thoughts and we don't follow the, figure out the social problems. Uh, it's worth noting that transparent brains are going to put strain on a lot of our institutions and ideas. Traditional liberal thinking in the West is based on this idea of an atomic self that roughly knows what it's doing. Uh, when we turn into a cluster of neural uh, systems interacting, as uh, sometimes happens in court cases, things get really confused. We might need to reinvent some of the aspects of how we think about the individuality in such a world. Thank That's you. going to be both dystopian and utopian at the same time to many people. Many of the technologies here are going to divide us quite strongly about whether they're a good or bad idea. Thank you. Um, Marilu, I saw you um, maybe dubious uh, when Anders was describing his, um, his uh, existential hope scenario. Uh, what do you think about it? Oh, uh, blood brain barrier, already approved FDA focused ultrasound. We're there. Our system will do it at a very low cost, so I don't see that as a problem. I think drugs go away because we can actually um, turn on and off different, different cells. But the bigger thing, the bigger thing that you're talking about, dystopian and utopian, I think this is inevitable, and yeah, there'll be regulation, and there'll be teenagers, and all of that, and there's actually very little that we can do to stop this. It's happening. The thing that we could do, I think it came up in our group, 
John Gilmore actually said it. Like, here's the thing, is we've got neurodiversity. If we don't start celebrating it, we're gonna stop it. And so that is focusing on brain disease, which is first track for all of these, all of the devices that we're making, be it EEG or, or the different systems. The most expensive healthcare in every country in the world is that for brain disease. It's two billion people today, one billion of whom can't work if you add in mental disease like depression, schizophrenia, and so forth, with neurodegenerative disease, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and so forth. And so helping those people is super key. It's in every family, we don't talk about it that much, but there's neurodiversity of thought, and can we solve problems better through this, um, through, through using these interfaces? Um, we were talking about autistic people yesterday, and how they're very good at solving certain types of problems, but socially they're not accepted in a, lot of, in a lot of situations. And so if we can get through that, maybe we can get to this Star Trek kind of utopia in that it's a multidisciplinary team. Each, each person in, on the enterprise is really good at a different thing than the other person, right? And so they could work together as a team. And that's the sort of utopian vision is, can we accept our differences in each other? And I think I don't think we're gonna, I think it's just gonna be the same old, of course there's gonna be companies that try to make money. Surprise, right. And of course there's gonna be nonprofits, but basically I think, you know, to quote Peter Gabriel, like this is coming. How do we take uh, swimming lessons to order how to deal with our own vulnerab vulnerabilities, the things we're not gonna say, the poker face or not, and the rest of it. How do we learn how to do that? And I think it's celebrating the differences in us and how do we, that, that I think is the key. I could be wrong. Please, Zary, now. Please respond. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think the blood-brain barrier has been conquered. The only reason I brought it up is that uh, we can't, at present, uh, do these things at distance. The equipment has to be very close to the brain. Uh, and um, I imagine that at some point in time, we will want to be able to do these things at distance. Uh, so that, but, but yeah, Mary Lou's totally right that, uh, to some extent that the blood-brain barrier has been cracked. Um, and then the other thing I want to say is... Um, yeah, I imagine that as we start to, you know, we live in a very uh, sort of self-oriented world, as Anders was mentioning, and the sense of self is something that's like very difficult for us to come to terms with crumbling. Uh, but I think as we start to be able to share neural information, uh, that will start to change. And I imagine that, uh, so yesterday we talked about uh, predictive coding as our, our sort of model of how we think brains work. Um, uh, and the idea is that the, the individual brain is l largely a, a multitude of uh, simulations and we sort of compare the actual feedback we get from the world with our predicted versions of the world. Um, and that's how we sort of orient ourselves. This is our current theory. Um, and I imagine that as we start to have uh, sort of uh, collective neural transparency, we will start to be able to predict, uh, make predictive models, shared predictive models of the world in a sort of collective fashion and that our sense of self will change fundamentally. Amazing, thank you. Um, before we open the floor to the audience, perhaps a last question. Uh, how do you see this, and uh, Daniel, you can p perhaps help us here, how do you see um, this vision fit in with the other technologies um, we have worked on or tried to envision better futures for this weekend? Or is neurotech very isolated? Uh, quite the opposite, I would say. Uh, obviously, we need the biotechnology to reach into the body. The optogenetics is already giving us a fantastic abilities to interface with the brain in a kinder, gentler way than plugging electrodes in. But on the other hand, nanotechnology, of course, would allow us to make electrodes that work better. And then we have machine learning. One reason we can do so much right now is actually not improvement uh, so much in the sensors as we can process the information. So AI is obviously super relevant here. Those are kind of just the most obvious ones. And I think similarly, the application areas in space, you definitely want the newer technology to keep your astronauts and space settlers happy and uh, functional. One of the things I was going to say this afternoon, but it's probably worth mentioning now, is that uh, one of my big updates in hearing the different tracks and sessions is just how important the sequencing is of neurotech and how, de how dependent a lot of the dystopian and utopian scenarios 
are on other problems. And while I think this is generally true across the utopian dystopia discussion, it feels especially true in, in the neurotechnology. So many of the, the, the discussions of where we tilt into dystopias hinge on uh, economic viability of different cognitive models on figuring out uh, multipolar traps in uh, in social interaction when there's no difference between our minds. Um, so, so many different sort of areas of social fat hacking uh, and being able to intrude on your minds or change it or make you unthink thoughts before you have them. Um, all of those things are, are fundamentally like linkages between the other discussions that we have that I, I think are somewhat asymmetric with neurotech because it really hits to the core of, of human agency. Um, and the one other thing I, I want to say though is I, I think it's important that we get the phenomenology right. Like when, when we even think about, to Zarina's point, about how um, social interaction changes uh, as the barriers between our minds start to come down, uh, I think the onus is on us as technologists to think deeply about what sort of phenomenology will happen. Will there be clusters of minds that act as one? Will there be uh, an expansion of neural diversity or a contraction? Because right now there's only boundary conditions based on the semantics of language. And when you now have boundary conditions based on, on finer grain thoughts themselves, uh, you, know, you, you, you now might have a great homogen, uh, homogenization of, of human minds. So um, this is sort of a call to action for us to really run the simulation in our heads about how uh, society and groups of people will work as these uh, barriers come down. Thank you. And now uh, we can take questions uh, from the audience. Do we? So it's interesting to see that we are all very rational people and we're thinking about the effect of this on how people think. Uh, but there's also this issue of you know, how, how does this affect if this is used for emotional or sensual experiences and what that impact can be. And the utopia obviously gives sort of a, a form, it could be an art form, but in the dystopian scenario, there's issues of you know, addiction and dependency. If you look at analogies to the opioid epidemic or to, um, there's some serious economic study that part of the reduction in uh, in, in employment is actually due to people choosing to stay at home with their parents and play video games. Um, so is that something that we should also kind of think about? Uh, so generally, when we have been talking about, we have been using the word think here, I think, as a shorthand for general mental activity. Uh, but also the discussion was too short to get into a lot of the really interesting subtleties. For example, cognition enhancing drugs, a lot of them seem to work mostly by being motivation enhancers rather than making you smarter. That's good enough for many practical purposes, at least if you need to churn out a paper. Obviously, the emotional aspects are very subtle. I have written papers, for example, about love enhancement, and the ethics of that gets way trickier than the normal ethics of enhancement, because suddenly at least two people are involved, and it gets very subtle and complicated. The traditional bioethics gets into trouble. So this is something that needs to be developed much more. So let me give you the background of the question, which is that when you look at when you look at biology and when you look at um, what you see are the evolution of membranes. Membranes form boundary conditions. You have a question, do you have an impermeable membrane or do you have a membrane where you've got uh, selectivity and it's the ability to, to maintain boundary conditions and select what enters or exits that gives you a lot of basis for success or failure in life. You can extend that issue of boundaries into things like property rights and property law, as well as human boundaries, violation of boundaries between human beings. So what you're talking about here is a radical elimination of boundaries and property rights in effect to the self. And now I'd like to ask the question, which is great. Let's talk about uh, parasites, forced invasion, uh, what you see from the human cognitive, cognitive perspective are we see things like antisocial personalities, sociopaths, psychopaths, devastating. So on the one hand, you are talking about revelation of fact, which makes it easier to deal with deception and duplicity, but you're also talking about invasive conditions. A lot of the stuff you've been talking about in terms of coordination cooperation implies beneficence if only Quiddy could understand better. Yeah. Let's talk about malevolence. Okay. Um, so to be clear, I, I wasn't suggesting in the utopian version that there is full open transparency. So for the property uh, analogy, I'm not suggesting that we all open all of our windows and doors, 
uh, I'm suggesting that we, are, we are, have the agency to decide who to share our information with, when, and what kind of information. So Dan and I might decide to go out there and, 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 and sort of like, you know, talk about what we're going to do this afternoon, and I could just be like, oh, well, I'm just going to share, share this part of uh, my sort of neural processing with Dan so they can understand where I'm coming from. That's what I mean. I'm not talking about uh, just opening up our, our, ourselves entirely. Uh, but just to touch on your idea of uh, psychopaths and soci sociopaths, one of the things we discussed yesterday was the, the sort of maybe slightly optimistic hope that by being able to share our um, sort of neural representations, we will be able to understand what led a person to do the thing that they did. Um, and so we might be able to sort of understand these kinds of like uh, antisocial behaviors a little bit better uh, and be able to treat them better. It's Thank also you. worth noticing, and this is the tricky part on your diversity, sociopaths are people too. A lot of people have real problems with that concept. But it is, I think, a real issue here. Where do you cure? Where do you understand? Where do you say, okay, I'm just not going to deal with you. You got the total wrong brain for my encounter. There is going to be a lot of building up social norms and functions here. Thank it's you. just, in a word, filters. We, we have a lot of ways to do this already in technology. We use filters, great. Mm -hmm. uh, on the more practical side, uh, two-part question. Would, would, you, would you consider the, the um, intermediate step of being able to read out action potential on every neuron in a mouse brain at roughly one millisecond time resolution to be an important intermediate uh, step in terms of uh, like helping the technological progress of understanding brains? And two, what, what do you think would be the most, if so, what do you think would be the most uh, likely technology to get to that intermediate step? Well, we're doing it without action potential because what proceeds uh, a voltage going down, uh, a current going down an axon is that membrane roughening for the ionic channels. And when the membrane roughens, guess what it does? It scatters. And since we descatter the light, I can tell you if I, if I put sandpaper on these glasses, it would scatter the light. And so you can see the differential. Not, I'm an electric, electrical engineer too, but there's this thinking in neuroscience that's very um, monolithic. Of, it has to be action potential. And that's actually not how the neuro, and, and that the neurons are the most important thing. What about the glia? What about the hormones? What about all this other stuff? And it's just a very, um, I think we have to break that open. But yeah, sure, we can do the action potential, but not optogen optogenetically because that's genetic modification of the body. That's what the Chinese guy just got in trouble for with the baby. Like, uh, we can do it without changing our ge genetics. Uh your question about what use would it be to read out all the action potentials of a mouse brain. Uh, obviously, I'm interested in brain emulation oh, in the long run. Sorry, not just the mouse brain, our brains. All of, right? How many action potentials can you read simultaneously? Well, we're, we've got 100 billion neurons. Each can you read all of them? Th that's what we're working towards. Uh, and so I, then I, I talk to a computer scientist. Here. Yeah, yes. so hmm? here's the a more interesting question. Say we can do this on the sensing side. I've had computer scientists, very, very famous computer scientists, said, well, then the problem's still intractable, 100 billion neurons each with 100,000 different connections. And I think, well, and then there's this famous paper um, trying to take a silicon chip that um, drives the video game Donkey Kong, and by zapping out each transistor following current neuroscience uh, techniques, can you figure out how Donkey Kong works? And the answer is, well, no, not by zapping it out. And it's because there's no hierarchical understanding of the layout. And so what you need to do first is get that hierarchical understanding, and then you could do it. Okay, okay, Nonofibers. Well, we are out of time, so thank you so much for this session, and thank you so much for yesterday. It was really good, and um, yeah, have a great day. <laughs>